within occupied territory on the far left coast. You're listening to On The Move with Max Worley III. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, patriots and preppers. I'm Mac Worley III, and this is On The Move, the show that attempts to inspire you to stand up for your rights. As I said before, this is not my show. This is your show. This is your grassroots activism movement. It's the On The Move movement. It cannot function without you, however, it is bigger than one man. I want to thank each and every one of you for your patriotism and for taking the time to get involved. Today is going to be a really great show. The date is February 2nd, 2014, and today is Super Bowl Sunday. If you're listening live, that means that you don't care about the Super Bowl or you value this show higher than the Super Bowl. And for that, I want to thank you for tuning in. I'm guessing that because of today's game, there won't be as many of you out there listening live. But if there are, please let us know if you're out there. You can always tune in uh, and give us a call at 619-924-0986. Again, that is 619-924-0986. Or you can email the show at talk at onthemoveshow.com. We, are, we have the phone lines open right now, so it doesn't matter what I want to talk about. This is your show. If you have something on your mind, give us a call and let us know. Um, today we do have a really good sh- show in store for you. Uh, we will have the voice of reason on the show today. He'll be discussing the financial system. With that said, I'm going to be talking about a bunch of other topics that have been in the news lately, some of which are Obama's State of the Union address and basically how it affects the checks and balances And, you know, whatever else comes up that you guys would like to talk about, like I said, we'll be taking listener calls and reading your emails. If you would like to join the conversation today, give us a call, 619-924-0986. Again, 619-924-0986. Or email the show at talk at onthemoveshow.com. Don't forget to check us out at onthemoveshow.com, here at blogtalkradio.com forward slash onthemoveshow, facebook.com forward slash onthemoveshow, youtube.com forward slash onthemoveshow, and twitter.com forward slash onthemoveshow. Uh, all right, one thing I'd like to mention here, and I know you guys hear me bring up the store and, and say to go to go to onthemoveshow.com, click the shop link on the homepage, and I know you've heard me in the past say we've got hundreds of products for sale on there. we got t-shirts, freeze-dried food, you know, books I recommend, bumper stickers, and a whole lot more. Well, there, I want you to know that I actually had a conversation with one of our listeners, and he's, he was mentioning how he's heard me talk about that over and over again. And he actually took the time to go to our website, onthemoveshow.com, and he went to our merchandise store, and he was talking about all the designs that we have on there, and he asked me if they're all original. And I explained to him, yes, they are all original. We created them just for our store. Uh, my wife is a, a professional graphic designer. This is what she does for a living. And, you know, the designs are either, you know, out of my head or out of her head. And they're made specifically for you guys. It's for Patriots by Patriots. And your purchases will actually help to make our show big, bigger and better. So if you want to support somebody and you want to buy some awesome products, and, again, all, all those products on there, all those designs in the merchandise store, those are all stuff that I wanted personally and, and I made. So, you know, it, it, nothing in there is something that I wouldn't wear. And I'm sure if you guys took a look at it, it's uh, at cafepress.com forward slash on the move show, or you can just go to on the move show.com and click the shop link. You're going to see all the cool designs we have on there. And I promise you, you guys are going to like at least one of them. So, all right. So, uh, one thing I would like to mention is um, the thing that we've been doing for the past few shows, and, uh, you know, I've been in discussions here with uh, PatriotFB.com. It's Jeff Norton of the Midnight Patriot. We are joining him in his network, and we're trying to work out the technical side of it because he broadcasts over Spreaker, and I broadcast over Blog Talk Radio. So there's a little bit of, uh, of, of technical know-how that we need to figure out how to do, basically, before we can make the switch over it. But... I'm really excited about this switch to PatriotFB.com. It's going to be really fun, and it's going to be really cool to be part of this. Uh, PatriotFB.com, if you're not familiar with it, go to PatriotFB.com right now. Check it out. It's a place where Patriots can go where we won't have to worry about being censored. And like I said, we're we're still working out all the technical details on joining the network. It's going to take some time. But I'll keep you guys all updated on everything that's going on, uh, you know, when there are any changes or once we go on there with Facebook.com forward slash On The Move Show. 
and you can get all the updates on what's going on with that. Everything's going to stay the same about the show, except the quality is going to be better, and we're going to be providing it through multiple links instead of just the ones. So you have different ways that you can access the show if you want. All right, so one thing I would like to talk about for a moment is, is what we're actually doing here. Like I say at the beginning of every episode, this is not just a radio show. This is a movement. This is a movement to get people to assert their rights, to speak out against tyranny, to stand up for the Constitution, and to network with other like-minded patriots, and to work together to educate the public, inspire, and spread a message of individual liberty and personal responsibility. You know, I've been thinking about what to call you, my loyal listeners, uh, who've decided to join the movement and to get on the move. These, these are the people that have decided to not only get inspired themselves, but to inspire others to speak up and stand up for their rights. You've heard of activists before, right? Obviously you have. And there's hacker groups out there that call themselves hacktivists. So if you're part of this movement, you're a mactivist. That's M-A-C-K, Tuvist, Mactivist, all right? You're part of a group of people that will have your back and stand up for you when you cannot stand up for yourself. This movement will only get bigger from here, but it depends on you. Help spread the message of liberty. Talk to people. Attend events. Use social media to wake people up to what's going on in our country. Create your own podcast. Create your own YouTube channel. Just do something. Contact your congressmen and women consistently. Don't just listen to the show. Get involved. Also, if you have something on your mind, perhaps you've come up with a good idea or you think that I'm dead wrong on a subject, I want you guys to call in and let me know. 619-924-0986. Or if you're too shy to be on the air, and I get that. You know, a lot of people get really nervous when they're talking over the radio. And, you know, and I've said it before, I actually still get nervous to this day before I'm about to go on the air. So, you know, I, I can absolutely understand why you wouldn't want to call in. So if you have something on your mind, you have something you want to talk about or you'd like me to talk about, uh, you can, again, email us uh, at talk at onthemoveshow.com. So this show is a little different from other shows out there. The topics we discuss here are determined by you. If there's something that you feel is more important than we talk about, call in. You have the control. Even if it's something that I totally disagree with you on and I really don't care about at all, I will at least give you an opportunity to make your argument, Okay. So, again, with that said, give us a call. Let us know what's on your mind. The number to the show is 619-924-0986, or you can email the show at talk at on the move show. Now for today's first segment. We do this segment every time, first time. Uh, it's called Today in History. So, according to Wikipedia, on February 2nd, 1943, this is 71 years ago, the remainder of the Nazi army forces in, Stal in the Battle of Stalingrad surrendered and a major victory for the Soviets in World War II. The German offensive to capture Stalingrad began in late summer of 1942 using the 6th Army and elements of the 4th Panzer Army. The attack was supported by intensive Luftwaffe bombing, which was the elite uh, bombing force of the Nazis with the, the, their air force, basically. The bombing reduced much of the city to rubble. The fighting degenerated into building-to-building building fighting, and both sides poured reinforcements into the city. By November of, of uh, 1942, the Germans had pushed the Soviet defenders back at great cost into narrow zones, generally along the west bank of the Volga River. On 19 November 1942, the Red Army launched Operation Uranus, a two-pronged attack targeting the weaker Romanian and Hungarian forces protecting the German 6th Army's flanks. The Axis forces on the flanks were overrun, and the 6th Army was cut off and surrounded in the, in the city of Stalingrad. Adolf Hitler ordered that the army stay in Stalingrad and make no attempt to break out. Instead, attempts were made to supply the army by air and to break the encirclement from the outside. Heavy fighting continued for another two months. By the beginning of February 1943, the Axis forces in Stalingrad had exhausted their ammunition and their food. The elements of the 6th Army surrendered. And on February 2nd, 1943, the battle lasted five months, one week, and three days. That is unbelievable. Talk about a long battle. So uh, 
if you guys uh, if you guys want to talk about any other conversation today, we're we're moving on here. Give us a call. The number to the show is six one nine nine two four zero nine eight six. Again, six one nine nine two four zero nine eight six. Or you can email the show at talk at on the move show dot com. Okay, so now it is time for my favorite part of the show, and we're calling it the weekly defender. And now it's time for the weekly defender. You have the right to defend your life, the right to defend your family, and the right to defend your freedom. All right. The Weekly Defender is the segment where we report about armed citizens in the news who have used their firearms to defend their family, their property, and or themselves. Our first Weekly Defender we found in the San Antonio Express. A disabled homeowner shot a man through a window with birdshot late Sunday during what San Antonio police say was an attempted burglary in the 1700 block of South Sabanez Street. Ruben Hernandez, age 54, was watching TV at his home at about 8.30 p.m. on January 27, 2014, when he heard a loud banging that grew louder, according to the police report. A metal object was used to hit Hernandez's door, according to the police. Hernandez told police he had heard a voice of a man who was 19 years old, whom he knew, yelling at him to come out. Hernandez said he looked out the window and saw the man and the other two men at the door. Hernandez told police he's had con confrontations with this man before and he had threatened his life. Hernandez said the 19-year-old man and another man there, age 23, had been involved in confrontations with Hernandez and Hernandez's son, including one, uh, one that was several days earlier. Hernandez is disabled. And he was scared for his life, thinking that the other men were trying to break in, according to police. Hernandez grabbed a 12-gauge shotgun and fired one shot of number eight bird shot through the window, according to the police. He told the police he didn't want to kill anyone, which is probably why he used bird shot instead of, I don't know, a buck shot, which definitely would have killed somebody. The three men ran away uh, and down to the driveway to Meridian Street, Hernandez told police. The 23-year-old man had been shot and was taken to the hospital, according to police. A woman, age 36, drove the three men to the hospital in a Cadillac, according to the police. And the Cadillac had brass knuckles and two knives inside. The women and three men were charged with burglary of, uh, I'm sorry, with burglary of habitation with the intent to commit assault. Their names have not been released. So on our, our next weekly defender we found in the Times Dispatch. A would-be robber of 7-Eleven in South Richmond found that the tables were turned when the clerk shot him, Richmond police said. Robert Lee Brown, age 36, of Richmond, entered the store in the 1300 block of Jefferson Davis Highway at about 10.55 p.m. on January 26, 2014, and displayed a weapon that looked like a handgun, but really was a BB gun, said police. The two clerks uh, struggled with Brown, who bit one of the clerks on the left forearm. One of, the, one of the clerks produced a handgun and grazed Brown in the upper arm, said police. We are not sure if the shooting was intentional or accidental, but police are not pursuing charges against the clerk, said Captain John O. Klesky. Klesky, sorry about that. Arriving officers caught Brown near the scene. Charges against Brown include attempted robbery and uh, for the alleged bite, uh, malicious wounding, Okleski said. So we love hearing about how law-abiding citizens use firearms to protect themselves. You have a right to defend your life. You have a right to defend your family. And most importantly, you have a right to defend your freedom. We at On The Move support your rights. And if you have a story about how you lawfully defended yourself or would like to make a uh, comment on one of these stories, we would definitely like to hear from you. Give us a call. The phone number of the show is 619-924-0986, or you can email the show at talk at On The Move Show. All right, so at this point, we're going to take a quick break, and I'll be back in a few seconds. on the move help us make this podcast bigger and better you can do this by going to our store and purchasing one of our hundreds of products all designs are original and made for patriots like you 
just go to cafepress.com slash on the move show. We appreciate your support. Need design services? Logo design for $90, business cards, brochures, bumper stickers, signs, flyers, promotional products such as mugs, pins, bags, keychains, magnets, and so much more. Contact Latasha Worley for a quote on your next project at Tasha, T-O-S-H-A, at lworleyphotography.com today. Or visit me on the web at lworleyphotography.com. And on Facebook at facebook.com slash lworleyphotography. And on Twitter at twitter.com slash Tasha Worley. Show your support for a designer who believes in the Constitution and your rights. And we're back. I appreciate you guys sticking with us. So when we last left the show, we uh, wrapped up the Weekly Defender. We were discussing uh, today in history before that. And uh, basically, we're going to move into the next segment of the show here. We like to call it the Mac Attack. This is a segment of the show where I like to weigh in on what I think is outrageous news uh, that has been in the news cycle lately. If you'd like to join the conversation, you can give us a call at 619-924-0986. Again, that's 619-924-0986. Or you can email the show at talk at onthemoveshow.com. All right, so I would like to talk about the, the recent stuff that Obama has been doing um, he's been out pushing an agenda here where he is going to basically bypass Congress and he's going to go around them. He says he's got a pen and a phone and it doesn't matter you know, what Congress is doing. He's just going to go around them and basically usurp the power. And you know, this really isn't that much of a surprise, honestly, because this is kind of what he's been doing. This is his M.O. This is what he's been trying to do the whole time. He said he's going to bypass Congress. He has is absolutely no problem bypassing Congress. So, in fact, I have a montage I've played for you guys before about how he'll go around Congress. I'll go ahead and play it for you real quick. The Senate blocked the bill that would have created this commission. So I'll issue an executive order that will allow us to go forward because I refuse to pass this problem on to another generation of Americans. some here wish that I could just bypass Congress and change the law myself. I know there's some folks who wish I could just bypass Congress. I can. Now I know some people want me to bypass Congress and change the laws on my own. Believe me. And And, and, and believe me, uh, right now dealing with Congress, the idea but, but, but believe me, uh, believe me, the idea of, of doing things on my own is very tempting. Yeah, it's very tempting for him to usurp the power of the Congress and just go around and create his own laws. But, you know, this stuff hasn't prevented him in the past. You know, he's been doing this. He's been deciding what laws he's going to enforce. He's been basically playing dictator and going around the Constitution. He's been creating his own laws. He's been he, he's totally changed Obamacare. He has just pushed off mandates that are written in the law. He can't change the law, by the way. All he can do is enforce the laws that are out there. That's the whole point of the executive branch is to enforce the laws that we already have on the books. But he's changing which laws he's going to enforce. He's deciding what he he thinks is, is, is the right thing to do, which is not his job. He's not Congress. But it doesn't seem to matter anyway, you know, because Congress isn't doing anything. They're just you know, going along with this, and, and they have no problem with it. Here's another clip of Obama talking about how he's going to bypass Congress. It's wrong. And I refuse to take no for an answer. 
These are ideas that have support from Democrats. They have support from Republicans around the country, independents around the country. I want to work with Congress to get them done. But when Congress refuses to act, and as a result hurts our economy and puts our people at risk, then I have an obligation as president to do what I can without them. No, you do not. Your obligation is to enforce the laws that we have on the books. That's your only job, is to enforce the laws that we have on the books. You are the executive branch. You're not the legislative branch. You're not the judicial branch. And you certainly don't speak for the people in regards to making laws and deciding what laws you're going to enforce and which laws you're not going to enforce. That's not your job. So here's Obama talking about how he has a pen and a phone and he's going to make executive orders and just basically usurp power of Congress and just violate the Constitution. And he's putting it all right out there for you all. He's telling you what he's going to do. He's going to make phone calls to people who have some clout so these lobbyists in Congress uh, will, will, will continue to lobby to let these, uh, the congressmen allow this stuff to happen. So he's going to call unions. He's going to do all this stuff. He's going to basically call people of influence with his phone. And he's going to write things down in executive orders to basically create law, which is totally unconstitutional, and he doesn't have the authority to do. Here he is, his own words. Uh, we are not just going to be waiting for legislation in order to make sure uh, that we're providing Americans uh, the kind of help that they need. Uh, I've got a pen, and I've got a phone. Uh, and I can use that pen to sign executive orders uh, and take executive action. Okay, so he wants to make executive orders and take executive action. This is not the way that things were supposed to operate. This isn't, this isn't the way that, that our founding fathers intended things to work. And, uh, you know, as far as the State of the Union address, I don't know how many of you people sat through that. It was really upsetting. I, I feel like I'm watching a train wreck when I listen to him talk and give speeches about this because... You know, I hear him up there talking about how he's basically going to destroy our country and fundamentally destroy the republic. He's talking about how he's basically just going to alter the way things. We've done things historically for 250 years, um, you know, 233 years, something like that. Um, uh, I, I don't know exactly right now, but, but yeah, it, years, hundreds of years, and he is... He's just going to change it. He's just going to decide that he's going to do things, you know, whatever way. And the, the worst part about it is, is that Congress starts clapping. They're clapping at their own power being taken away. They're clapping at Obama literally making them useless. You know, I was listening to Glenn Beck, and uh, they were talking about how there was a scene from Star Wars where the Republic becomes an empire. And, man, i got to tell you, that really, really resonated with me. And I I've got the clip here. And i I got to tell you, you know, I really do think that this applies for our current situation. Here's the clip. In order to ensure the security and continuing stability, the Republic will be reorganized into the first this is how liberty dies. It's under the claw. Okay, so I don't know how well that came over there, but it's a speech where the, uh, the emperor, uh, he, he's talking in front of the Senate, and he's saying that he's going to basically reform the republic into a galactic empire, the first galactic empire, and he's the emperor. So that, that, I mean, honestly, that's what we see. That's what we keep seeing Obama doing. He's becoming the first galactic em e emperor, basically, the first emperor of the United States. And, and I thought, Glenn Beck, you know, they really hit it on the head when they were talking about this. Uh, you know, we've seen this throughout history. It happened to the Romans. Julius Caesar, he usurped power and turned the Roman Empire or the Roman Republic into a Roman Empire. You know, our founders knew that this was a possibility. They feared the man on the white horse that I've mentioned in the past. They feared that one man would come in 
and claimed to have all the answers to our problems and that people would give him all the power that he, he desired and essentially turn him into an emperor. They knew that during times of crisis, people will turn to their government to save them and, uh, and willingly give up liberty to obtain security. Not to mention the fact that most of the problems that we're having in our country right now are caused by our government. But, you know, that's a philosophy of, of the liberal progressive movement is to create a crisis and to become the answer. You know, that they already know what they're going to do before they create the crisis. That way they can step in and take more of our, our security, to, to, or to take more of our liberty, I'm sorry, under the guise of saying that they're here to protect us. You know, they say that the NSA, and I'm sorry to keep beating the same drum here of the NSA. I talk about the NSA to exhaustion, and I understand. But they say that the NSA could have stopped us from having 9-11 happen to us. They say that with the NSA there, you know, we could have prevented that tragedy. And, and believe me, you know, if, if, if that was true, then, you know, maybe I could understand that. But since then, we had the Boston bombing. Well, wait a second. They didn't stop the Boston bombing, did they? No, they did not. So if they could do this kind of stuff with the kind of NSA spying that they're using right now, then they would have stopped the Boston bombing. And even if they could... It's still unconstitutional, and t I'm, I'm telling you, I, I will use this quote over and over again because it's so good. Benjamin Franklin said, those that would sacrifice a little liberty to gain a little security deserve neither and will lose both. Giving power to the government is not the answer. Giving power to the people is the answer. Allowing people to be armed allowing people to defend themselves. You know, and again, it's not, it's not the government doling out these responsibilities, but they sure are the ones that are restricting us. You know, we're the only country in the world that has a constitution that, that isn't telling us what we can do. It's telling us what we, what we can't do as far as the laws of the land. The constitution is telling the government what they can't do. So every other country in the world, their idea of law is that, a law has to be passed in order for you to know that it's legal to do something. You know, so, so everything is illegal unless there's a law passed saying that you can do it. That's how every other country in the world works. We are the only society that has, has this, this idea, this concept of liberty, that everything is legal. Every single thing in the world is legal unless somebody passes a law saying we can't do it. And, and think about that. I mean, we are the last stand. We are the beacon of hope for the rest of the world. You know, no other country has this thought of liberty like us because they, they let their government tell them what they can and can't do. We don't. Our government is, is, is beholden to us. We are the ones that say what we can and can't do. If the government gets out of control, we are the ones that bring them back in check. At least we're supposed to. So with that in mind... Our founding fathers, they established checks and balances. You know, laws are created by the legislative branch. They're enforced by the executive branch. And its constitutionality is constantly scrutinized within the court system. At least that's what's supposed to happen. The problem is, a lot's changed since our republic has been created. Things have happened that there was no way that our founding fathers could have predicted. So... Uh, I have here right now uh, somebody uh, uh, somebody who would like to talk about this. This is uh, Tank. I'm going to be bringing her on here. And uh, she is the host of her own blog talk radio show. Tank, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm really good. Well, I, I heard you talking about Obama's executive orders. And, you know, I just kind of wanted to add something into what you were already saying. Um, a lot of people have the misunderstanding that Obama is happy-go-lucky when it comes to executive orders. If you compare Obama to Bush, Bush signed 291 executive orders. Obama's only signed 168, so in comparison, it's actually a lot less. But if you look at the executive orders that were signed, um, Obama's have been much more damaging and a lot more frightening. Now, you and I don't have the time to go through every single executive order that each of them signed, but um, one that Obama did sign that, in my opinion, is particularly offensive 
is Executive Order Number 13603, and that's the National Defense Resources Preparedness Order. And basically what that encompasses is um, the President and his Cabinet have the ability to commandeer and control um, pretty much a broad scope of resources, like water, human and animal food, transportation, energy, construction material, health resources, farm equipment, fuel, and, I mean, that list just goes on and on. So Mm -hmm. if you wanted to know more about it, you'd actually have to research it and reference that order. Um, And, you know, Obama's also done some executive orders as it relates to gun control and our Second Amendment rights. Mm -hmm. Um, So if you go back and, you know, if you're looking at just the basic numbers, there have been other presidents that have exceeded Obama's number of executive orders. But if you actually go through the list of things that have been signed by Barack Obama, I find that they're much more uh, intimidating and definitely set a path of un-American leadership from Mm -hmm. this particular administration. Absolutely. You, you know, one argument I, I've heard, and, and I understand, you know, uh, why you said it and you referenced it as far as Bush. You know, people will always say, well, hey, Bush did it, Bush did it. But it, even still, you know, first of all, let me just be clear. I'm I'm not necessarily a fan of Bush, honestly. I, I'm, I'm not a Republican. I, I'm a constitutional, you know, conservative libertarian. So I'll vote for whoever is out there looking out for the best interest of the Constitution and the Republic. Um, you know, it, it's, as far as Bush, though, uh, you were right. You look at the the content of these executive orders. You know, if, if they're actively trying to to basically dismantle the republic, go after the the, uh, the constitution, go after gun owners, and, you know, and and establish this kind of like totalitarian government where it's the executive branch that's creating these laws and deciding which laws he's going to enforce. And, you know, that's not the way it was it was meant to establish. Like I was saying, uh, the the founders they had no way of predicting what was going to happen uh, in the future. So some of these things that happened, like for example, the Seventeenth Amendment. The Seventeenth Amendment took away the ability for the legislators of the states to elect representation in the Senate, and they gave that that representation to the people. So the senators were actually supposed to be elected by the states, and that's the way it worked. And this essentially changed who the Senate worked for. Uh, you know, they're no longer holding the best interest of what state they come from, but instead they're looking at w- what the people would be concerned about, that, because that's who's voting them in. So, I mean, the, the 17th Amendment, it totally uh, created a situation where uh, the people are now represented twice in Congress, and our founders, you know, they only intended the people to be represented once in Congress through the House of Representatives. This is a check and balance, and... You know, there's no way for our founders to, to have been able to predict that, uh, that Congress would, would change like this, and also that they would willfully be on board with the president usurping a, their power and essentially making them useless. This is all now possible because of the 17th Amendment, and the states have no say in Congress, and no one is looking out for the sovereignty of the states. What do you think about that? Uh, well, I think it's totally screwed up. But, um, you know, I mean, basically what I was trying, the point I was trying to make is that, you know, I I see a lot of alarmist, um, I see a lot of alarmist comments on social media, you know, about the number of executive orders that Barack Obama has signed. As a matter of fact, recently I saw a post that was saying that he had signed like 930 uh, different executive orders, which isn't true. And I think it's important for, you know, your listeners to dig a little bit deeper, and and my listeners as well, and anybody posting on social media, to remember that you have the responsibility to dig a little bit deeper and to make sure that you know what you're talking about before you repost or, you know, say something that has the potential to create a domino effect. You know, if you combine... Theodore Roosevelt and Franklin Roosevelt, the two of them put together, uh, they signed over 4,500 executive orders. Bill Clinton signed about 350, 360 different executive orders. I'm not sure of the exact number, but the point is is that you you, you can't just look at the number 
that was signed. You mm -hmm. really need to look at the content. And that I, does I require a significant amount of dedication on your part. You know, I mean, who wants to sit down and go through 150 different executive orders? Who has the time? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, another, but, another thing, it's just like Congress, how you know we're passing bills through Congress that are thousands of pages long, and they haven't even had an opportunity to look at them, obviously, because they're voting on them within, like, you know, 24, 48 hours or something like that. And well, right, because it, you have to pass it before you know what's in it. <laughs> absolutely, yeah. That, that's, uh, that's, I believe that's Nancy Pelosi who said that. You have to pass it to yes, find, yes, find it out what's was. in it. Actually, you know, hold on, I got the clip. <laughs> yeah, I got, I got the clip right here. One second. But awesome. we have to pass the bill so that you can uh, find out what is in it away from the fog of the controversy. Yeah. So, you know, th this, is, this is what they, they, they tell us. And we, you know, we're supposed to trust these guys. We're supposed to just put all of our faith in, in our government. But they're not even reading the bills that are being passed. And at the same time, you know, we have our – and, again, I, I totally understand where you're coming from, your point of view as far as, you know, the, the number isn't, isn't the same. And you ought – I totally agree with the fact that you have to watch what you – where you get your information from. I saw that same post you're talking about where it had 900 and something on there. Somebody actually posted it on my website or uh, my, my Facebook. And, um, you know, I, I don't know where, that, where they got that information from and – I still have to do a lot more research on these executive orders, but the ones I've looked at, and I saw the one um, that you're referencing as far as, you know, the, the emergency preparedness one where they have the ability to take your power or, or take, uh, take away your equipment, your food, and all this stuff. But um, one thing that that one reminded me of was uh, very similar. Uh, I believe it was around World War II. I can't remember what president did it. Uh, they they had a uh, ability to basically take away your gold. They made the owning gold illegal. Are, are you familiar with that one? Uh, you know, I'm not off the top of my head. I'd have to do a little bit of research on it, but I think it's something worth looking into. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it reminded me a lot of, uh, of the executive order that, that Obama passed with that. They, they made owning gold illegal, and they also had some, uh, some, uh, some law where it was illegal to, uh, to hoard food for more than a certain amount of days. I can't, I can't remember which one it is. I'll have to look it up and, uh, and put it on uh, one, one future episode or something. But I really do appreciate you calling in, Tank. Uh, do you want to plug your show or anything else you guys got going on? Um, no, that's not necessary. I was just calling in to make a comment. But, yeah, I mean, I, I think the most important thing here, like my mega point overall, is that, you know, if you want to hold your representatives and your senators and your president accountable, that, you know, it's also important that you know what you're talking about ahead of time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. I, I definitely agree with you on that. Uh, go, go ahead and tell my listeners what, what the name of your show is so they can they can at least listen to you. Cause they, I mean, I, I like your guys' point of view. I've listened to one show of you you're already, but I would like to uh, tune into some more. So I'll be checking your guys out. I want to hear uh, some more of what you guys have to say, but I'd like my listeners to get an opportunity to hear you as well. Well, absolutely. Uh, the name of our show is Sounding Off with Tank and Tony, and you can find our group on Facebook under the same name. And we are on every Friday from 9 to 11.30 Eastern Time. Awesome. Okay, and that's here at Blog Talk Radio, right? Yes, it is. It's Blog Talk oh. just like you. Okay, cool. All right, well, I'm going to cut to a quick commercial break. I, I appreciate you giving us a call, Tank, and uh, I'll be back in about a minute 30, and we're going to have uh, the voice of reason on the show. All right, so here's a commercial. on the move help us make this podcast bigger and better you can do this by going to our store and purchasing one of our hundreds of products all designs are original and made for patriots like you just go to cafepress.com slash on the move show we appreciate your support need design services logo design for ninety dollars business cards brochures bumper stickers signs flyers promotional products such as mugs pins bags keychains, magnets, and so much more. Contact Latasha Worley for a quote on your next project at Tasha, T-O-S-H-A, at lwhurleyphotography.com today. Or visit me on the web at lwhurleyphotography.com. And on Facebook at facebook.com slash lwhurleyphotography. And on Twitter 
at twitter.com slash Tasha Worley. Show your support for a designer who believes in the Constitution and your rights. And we're back. When we last left the show, we were talking about checks and balances and the, uh, the way that Obama is basically trying to pass executive orders. We had a listener call into the show, uh, Tank, and she was talking about how it's important that we are checking our resources and, or sources and finding out basically if the information we're putting out is correct. And she, you know, she, she made some really good points. Uh, our next guest we have on the show here is the voice of reason. Are you there, sir? Yes, I am. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Uh, so I understand that you have some information that you've prepared about the financial system. Is that correct? Yeah, I, I started, um, I, I forget how many weeks ago I was on the show last time, and I wanted to continue with the financial system, but as I was thinking about it, I come up with all these ideas in my head about how everyday financial things affect us, and especially in a negative way, so I went off in that direction. Okay. So that's what I want to talk about today. Okay. All right, well, the floor is yours. Go right ahead. And and what we talked about last time, I was talking about the Federal Reserve and the IRS. I gave out some references, some books, and some pointers on you, points to, to YouTube. Just want to go mm-hmm. over them again real quick. I talked to you this week. You said you would put them up on on your YouTube site. I forget which one. Yeah, I'll be linking them down in the uh, description of the YouTube uh, video if you guys are listening to this on YouTube in the replay. Uh, and at the end of the show, I'll be linking, uh, putting the links down at the bottom of this on blogtalkradio.com. So if you're listening to the show on Blog Talk Radio and it's in the archive, it'll be there in about you know 10 minutes after the show's over. So Okay, so I have five things just to remind people from last time. One book is The Preacher from Jekyll Island, G. Edward Griffin. It talks about how the Federal Reserve was formed uh, in secrecy and how it was pushed upon us without even even, uh, people in Congress knowing about it because some of them were away for Christmas recess. Second book, The Law That Never Was by Bill Benson, talks about Uh, specifically more on how the 16th Amendment was never ratified and it made me take action in that I actually called the National Archive in Washington DC and asked for a copy of the 16th Amendment ratification and found that somebody had purposely written in names all in the same handwriting so that means we have a amendment to the Constitution that was not properly ratified and oh, wow. I thought for myself. Uh, another person is William Still, S-T-I-L-L, or also known as Bill Still, and he has videos about the U.S. fractionalized banking system, which was put in place by the international bankers who wanted us to have our Federal Reserve. He has a number of videos on YouTube. Uh, another one is uh, by Stefan Molyneux, M-O-L-Y-N-E-A-U-X, also on YouTube. It's called The Story of Your Enslavement, and I think it is a very succinct uh, video, about 40 minutes, on how this country is set up to make us run the treadmill, basically, and that we're getting somewhere. Then there's another one, The End of the American Dream, which is a one-hour animated video on YouTube, and it also talks about how our money system came into being in the Federal Reserve. And since it's a video, it might be good for younger folks to start getting interested in on what's really happening around them. So those are the references that I was talking about. (laughs) So... Okay, yeah, I'll be, I'll be linking those down at the bottom. So anybody, any listener who wants to check out all those things that he was just talking about, again, at the end of this show, I'll be putting it in the in the description of this uh, blogtalkradio.com uh, show. And also, if you're listening on youtube.com, it'll be in the description of this video. 
Go, go right ahead, Jim. Oh, uh, having a little bit of phone difficulty here. Oh, okay. Uh, I want to re uh, review some terms, first of all, that I'm going to be talking about through, through the next hour. And this will be more of a discussion between the two of us. Uh, first of all is money versus currency versus legal tender. And okay. money is something that I think should have some value, like the way we used to have it back before 1971 when the dollar was partially backed by gold and before the 1930s when it was fully backed by gold. Mm -hmm. So money you're should have value. You're referring to the you gold think? standard. Yes. Money should have something of value that it's attached to so we know what it's worth. When you mm -hmm. take it away, you get fiat currency, and it's the value of it is worth what we, the people, think it's worth, mm -hmm. or what we're told it's worth, more likely. And currency, to me, is the common coins and papers in circulation, and legal tender is uh, whatever legally satisfies a debt. According to the state according to the state. Okay. Now, we people used to trade seashells way back when, or salt. That was very important way back when. Yeah, back, uh, when, uh, term. back, back when the colonials first got here, uh, they used to trade uh, wampum. Uh, it's like these little blue beads or uh, different beads that, that the uh, Native Americans used to trade and they used to value. So uh, <clears throat> all, the, all the colonials, they used to actually sell uh, and trade wampum. Okay, so that, that's where the, the uh, $24 worth of beads to buy Manhattan Island came from? Yeah, yeah, well, it was all, it was all being used as, a, as a basically a big trade. It, they, they established a, a, a resource from that. They started, you know, collecting them and finding them and then using them to sell and trade to the Native Americans who would give them furs and stuff like that. So it's pretty interesting at, at what societies will come up with uh, as their own currency because, you know, it really, though, the wampum was just decorative. It was it was just kind of like what, what they made jewelry out of and stuff. So, uh, but the Native Americans wanted it and they valued it highly. So, you know, the, the, um, uh, the Americans started getting it and, you know, they were using it to trade, so. Oh, okay. So you learn everything, something every day. <laughs> <laughs> I want to talk about the, another definition is the velocity of money and it has to do with the supply of, and ease of obtaining credit. Wikipedia gives a good explanation of it that the velocity of money is uh, the frequency at which a unit of currency is used to purchase goods and services within a given time. So if, if I buy something from you and you take that dollar and buy something from somebody else and somebody else, if we do it quickly, we can increase that velocity of money. Okay. I, that's a that's a term that I didn't look up until this week. Okay. Yeah, I've, I, I haven't does, heard of that. Yeah, it, it, it does have something to do with our economy, and I'll get into that uh, soon. And then we have a fractionalized banking system, which people need to understand that in our modern banks, when a dollar is deposited, the bank can turn around and lend out nine more dollars that they actually don't have. And this was based on <clears throat> feeling that not everybody would, would ask for their money back at the same time, so after a while you felt comfortable lending out more and more of it, but it's not the bank's money. And it's very important to understand that there is uh, if there's all this money being loaned and there's the amount of original dollars being deposited, very few, most of the money that we have is electronic deposits and, and debits going back and forth. So, so what you're saying is that for every dollar that the, the bank has, uh, they loan out nine times that amount of money. And if everybody... If everybody made a run on the bank at the same time, obviously they wouldn't have 
uh, the, the money there that, that people uh, would have because they're too busy loaning it all out, basically. They're loaning out far more than what they actually have. Correct. Yeah, um, this, this is what we saw during the Great Depression when they had the runs on the bank. Right, the runs on the bank. And even though there's FDIC, even FDIC is set up that it's only going to uh, help a certain amount of people which is a small amount of people, if there was a run on the bank and everybody was insured for $100,000, but everybody took out $100,000, the FDIC would not be able to cover it all. Mm -hmm. So even that is based on a fraction of the population. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, the, the legs... Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, I, I was going to go into... One of, the, one of the things about this fractionalized banking is that if you go to buy a house, the chances are that the bank loan you anything is very low because of the fractionalized system. So back back when I got married and bought a house, <coughs> uh, borrowed about $180,000 and looked at the final payment over the life of the mortgage, it was four hundred fifty thousand dollars. Wow! This was about six and three quarters percent, which, if I had bought something just four or five years earlier, it would have been the the interest rate would have been in the teens. So you borrow eight one hundred eighty thousand dollars. The interest is one and a half times the principal, so about two hundred seventy thousand dollars. But when you think about it, the bank. What does the bank actually lend you? That's a good it's, point. Yeah. It's, it's those computerized numbers that fly back and forth between accounts. It's yeah. nothing that they actually had from a depositor, and it's nothing that they actually had for themselves. Yeah, they call that digitizing. But, yeah, digitized. And so when, um, and I forget what year it was, we refinanced, and I had the uh, assistant mortgage guy over at the kitchen table, and we're talking about a quarter of a percent here and there. And I look at him at one point, and I go, why are we arguing about this when it's my promissory note that creates all this loan? You don't lend me anything. And he stopped and said, you're right but nobody's ever called me on this before. Yeah, it's funny It's funny that he even knew that, though, because a lot of these bankers don't even realize or understand how the banking system works. So you know, it's kind of funny that you actually got somebody who understood what was going on. Yeah, and we had, we had a nice conversation after that, but he's just doing his job. Mm -hmm. So it makes me think back to when I first bought the house and I'm over at the mortgage place and there's a stack of papers, sign here, initial here, sign here. At one time I said, can I take this home and read it? Oh, they don't want you to take it home. Because <laughs> <laughs> they, don't, they don't want you to study this stuff. They just want you to sign it. And, yeah. they, and they're sitting over me talking about how they have a tea time at 4 o'clock and, and blah, blah, blah. One of those pieces of paper is called the promissory note. And when I signed that, that was my promise to pay the treasury the money that the treasury was going to lend me. So treasury, the bank, is basically a middleman for the treasury. Are you talking my about the US, my, the U.S. State Department treasury? <laughs> the U.S. what? The, the U.S. State Department treasury, is that is that who you signed the promissory note for? Is, it, is that the one you're talking about? Yeah, the U.S. Treasury in Washington Okay. Um, that uses the Federal Reserve currency. So that promissory note is signed, and it's an agreement between me and the Treasury to get this money. The bank's the middleman. So why is the bank charging me one and a half times the amount that I loaned, borrowed, as interest when they didn't have anything to lend me? And they're, they're not even lending you their money. They're, they're lending right. you the Treasury's money. 
Right. So between lending the Treasury's money through this promissory note and understanding fractionalized banking means that they don't have much to lend you in the first place, the chances are of getting anything from them directly is extremely low. And this, to me, is usury. And the Bible says usury is a sin. Well, define usury, because I've never heard that word before. Usury, U-S-U-R-Y, is the charging of excessive interest for for borrowing. Okay. And I think that if I borrow something, especially if you didn't have it to give me in the first place, and you're charging me 150% of what I borrowed, even though it's amortized over so many years, and also with the amortization rate, there the interest is being paid out you know, nine-tenths of what you pay the first couple of years is all interest. So mm-hmm. they're getting, they're not even getting it on an even basis. They're getting loaded. So uh, it just, I just need to tell people that this whole system of mortgages is really odd because of the way it's set up. And if somebody is going to give me something, I want to pay them. And then you see the bankers always have the tallest building in town and the biggest mansion and blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. But it's usury. People should understand what it is. And mm-hmm. it's one yeah. way, uh, as we're told that we grow up, get married, buy a house, and get a mortgage, to get that house, it drains us of a significant amount of our wealth while we're accumulating the wealth of that house. But a $180,000 house is, ends up costing $450,000. It's all, so it's all this big scam. Line. Yeah, it's, it just seems like it's a big scam where, you know, they're, they're loaning out nine times more money than what they actually have. They're, they're charging you exorbitant interest rates on it. And, you know, the, obviously uh, something isn't going right. And this is why all, all of our, uh, you know, our, our founders who valued the, the republic, like, for example, Thomas Jefferson, uh, you know, they, they, they all were talking about. Uh, how you know a, a central bank would be uh, you know a really devastating effect would have really devastating effects on the republic and create these kind of situations they warned us about this but you know we didn't listen you know so, something changed and how how did the the fed end up getting established in the first place well and that goes back to the creature from jekyll island and the law that never was uh, the short story on that is a bunch of these international bankers like J.P. Morgan and the Rothschilds, uh, Rockefellers, met at Jekyll Island off the coast of South Carolina, I believe, and they plotted in secrecy at this resort how to squeeze in a central bank again, one um, after Andrew Jackson uh, got rid of one, how to squeeze it in again, and basically when um, Woodrow Wilson became president, they cozied up to him and got him to sign it during Christmas recess. And as I said, the, it wasn't properly ratified. There weren't enough people there to uh, ratify it. Some said no. The clerk of the court, I think his name was Philander Knox, he wrote in enough names to that would, on the basis of the number of names alone, would ratify the 16th Amendment. But as I said, when I got a certified copy of myself, you could see right there that these were not individual signatures and that the 16th Amendment was never ratified. Okay, so, so the 16th Amendment, that, that is the amendment that established the, the Fed, just to clarify. Yes. Okay, so, so here's my question, okay, and the, first of all, uh, what year was this, the, was the amendment uh, ratified or not ratified properly? It was 1913, and we 1913. just had the 100th year anniversary of it. 
Okay. All right. So, so here's here's my question. And actually, I, I know uh, what you're talking about as far as the 100-year anniversary. I think there was somebody was saying that there's some kind of like treaty to where uh, or, or some kind of uh, something that needed to be reenacted in order to to reaffirm the Fed or something. And uh, I heard a lot of people saying, "Oh, the Fed's going to go away," but yeah, obviously it's not. It hasn't, and it's still there. Um, well, but w- I, I think when it was chartered, it had a 99 or 100-year span. When when corporations first started you know, coming into being, they had a they had a shelf life, mm-hmm. and if a corporation did what it was supposed to do, like build a railroad, and had no more work to do, it would be dissolved. So the Federal Reserve had a had something of a shelf life on it, a term, and my understanding, but I've heard from other people, it had some kind of lifetime deal. Okay. But uh, if it was, I was looking out in the news for anything that was telling me that this term was coming to an end and Congress had to vote it an extension for it, another hundred years or whatever, the mainstream media gave me nothing which is unfortunate. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I've, I mean, I've looked at a whole bunch of different sources trying to find out some more information of this charter. And, uh, you know, it, it's it's really confusing. Uh, you know, obviously I'm not a, a lawyer or a scholar, you know, in, in that aspect. But, uh, you know, I've, I've tried to look up some information to see why the Fed is still there, if they re-signed the charter or what happened. But I've, I haven't been able to find a whole lot on it so far. So, uh, you know, it, it's, yeah, it's as far as call in. What's that? If somebody knows more, call in. Oh, yeah, absolutely. The number of the show, 619-924-0986, 619-924-0986, or you can email the show at talk at onthemoveshow.com. Uh, and if you guys have any information on that, you know, join the conversation. We'd definitely like to hear from you. Uh, you know, we'll pick your brain if you have some more information than we do. So, um, Anyway, as far as uh, the, the creation of the Fed and how it's done, you know, one thing I've been thinking about lately, and I know you and I have talked about this before, um, and, you know, I've, I've talked about it at the, uh, the Constitutional Study Group with Ben, uh, is, is, is the Constitution still in effect? Is it still there? Uh, and and do, our, um, do our legislators know that it's, it's not there, which is why they can impose things on us like this, uh, you know, like the 16th and 17th Amendment, you know, where uh, it's it's clearly unconstitutional because they're ratifying things uh, in an unconstitutional fashion. But do they know that the Constitution isn't there? Is the Constitution there anymore because the contract has been uh, been voided uh, after the Civil War? You, you know the story of that, right? Yeah, uh, I, I've heard that. So we, we have uh, portions of the Constitution, if they're in effect, not being ratified, and then some other people, like Ben, had um, brought up the possibility that the, con- the Constitution was never um, in place in the first place. Well, that's it, not an is- area that I've studied. Okay. Well, well, what it is is not that the Constitution isn't in place to begin with, because it, it was the Constitutional Convention. It was signed by state legislators, and and, and those people. Uh, were the ones who decided whether or not they wanted the Constitution there in the first place. And they signed, they entered into a legal binding contract where it was voluntary. Nobody was forced into uh, signing the Constitution. So basically, after the Civil War, uh, one of the stipulations of the Constitution that the South said is that, you know, what, we get to continue having slavery, all right, and that was, a, that was a stipulation. We get to continue having slavery. There will be no laws passed, that, you know, abridging us from, from conducting slavery, uh, but after a certain year, we won't be allowed to import slaves into the United States anymore. And that was a stipulation on this contract. So you're signing a legal binding contract, and then down the line towards, you know, when uh, the, the Civil War happened, uh, and it just so happened to be shortly after the, the North, stop uh, using their ships to import slaves into the United States. So at that point, the North lost their motivation to allow slavery to continue because they're not using the, the slaves. They're just selling them to the South. So then the, the North got all high and mighty and was like, well, hey, we got a problem with slavery now that we're not making money from it. And slavery is horrible. Don't get me wrong. I totally 
think that, this, that, that slavery is one of the worst institutions that you could possibly have. However, uh, they, when they decided to invade the South after they left, they seceded from the Union because the North decided to pass the Emancipation Proclamation, which, it, which totally voided the contract, that, that went against one of the stipulations of the con constitutional contract that they entered. At that point, when the South left the Union, they were just dissolving uh, the, the contract because it, the, the North chose to violate and breach the Constitution that they entered into in, in the first place. So, you know, at that point, there is no contract. There is no Constitution. So, you know, the, after the war, the North started imposing its will on the South. They went in and basically, you know, uh, did military coups on the, on the legislator down there, the leadership ship down there. They replaced governors at gun by force. Uh, they, they basically handpicked people that would go along with their cause and, you know, go along and get along. And then uh, and, and they basically imposed their will. Lincoln, when, when he did all this, he said, I don't even know if this is legal, but I'm going to do it anyway to keep the union together. And because of all these actions that the North took, you know, th there is question of whether or not the Constitution is still there anymore if the contract has been dissolved. Because obviously... It hasn't been reaffirmed. We haven't had another state convention where everybody gets together and we all, you know, reaffirm the Constitution and re-sign it and make sure that everything's still there and legal. So if it's not legal, you know, if, if everything has been dissolved, can they do any unconstitutional act? Do they know that, it's un that the Constitution isn't there anymore? And is that why we, we see the laws that we have? Because they know there's no, there's no way that they can do anything unconstitutional. What do you think? Well, that and the fact that the average person just follows what the government puts out there, that's a, again, that's something that I'm going to have to study up. You, have you done a show on that? Uh, yeah, I, I actually had been on the show. Um, I think it was one of my first shows. It was uh, um, probably like you know, episode two or three. Okay, like I, I, did catch, I did catch part of that one. Yeah, it, we we were talking about this, but yeah, it's you know it's pretty crazy when you think about it in that term because uh, is the Constitution there? If a contract is voided, and and the whole thing about us entering into a republic is we are a group of sovereign states. Each state is their own sovereign territory, and they they control their own destiny, and they're entering into an agreement, a con a contractual agreement, to to join together as a union of these sovereign states. And it, it has to be voluntary. That that in order to have a republic, it has to be voluntary. And in in order for people to to have this constitution applied to them, they've had to have signed it. Well, the problem is that the, the contract was breached. So with the breach of contract, that there is no contract. So are these That's, actions that, that are makes sense? Yeah, I, I mean, are, are the actions that that Obama's taking, that the liberals are taking, even Republicans are taking, you know, through the Patriot Act, the National Defense Authorization Act, and all the things that they're doing through executive orders and things like that, these uh, executive branches, such as the Environmental Protection Agency, totally regulating our life and creating law through the executive branch, you know, it, uh, are all these things not even constitutional because there is no constitution. This is a question that I ask all the time. Wow. <laughs> and, and executive orders, from what I understand, <laughs> were not supposed to be anywhere near the, the types of things that are going on now. They were more of, uh, you know, there was some fire damage to the West Wing of the White House, get a, get a contractor and rebuild it, something like that. Not mm -hmm. things that were going to affect us personally, monetarily, militarily. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I, I'd like to talk about that some more when we get back from this break. Uh, are you going to be able to stick with us for a little bit longer? Oh, yeah. I've got a lot of stuff to go over. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, we'll be back in about a minute 30 then. On the move. Help us make this podcast bigger and better. You can do this by going to our store and purchasing one of our hundreds of products. All designs are original and made for patriots like you. Just go to cafepress.com slash on the move show. We appreciate your support. Need design services? Logo design for $90, business cards, brochures, bumper stickers, signs, 
flyers, promotional products such as mugs, pins, bags, keychains, magnets, and so much more. Contact Latasha Worley for a quote on your next project at Tasha, T-O-S-H-A, at lworleyphotography.com today. Or visit me on the web at lworleyphotography.com. And on Facebook at facebook.com slash lworleyphotography. And on Twitter at twitter.com slash Tasha Worley. Show your support for a designer who believes in the Constitution and your rights. All right, we are back. And when we last left the show, we had the voice of reason on with us, and we were discussing whether or not the Constitution still exists or not, and why the executive uh, orders were originally established. What were they meant to do in the first place? And uh, as far as as far as I've been able to interpret, and the things that I've studied uh, through through the research that I have done personally. Uh, the executive orders were actually created for the executive officer, the President of the United States, to be able to manage the uh, the offices that he's created, such as like the EPA and things like that. His executive orders were only supposed to be to, to help basically uh, create these these agencies and to, and to manage them, basically. And they were never intended to establish law or create policy that, that we're beholden to. Um, right. What, what are your thoughts on this? Well, just just what you said, and like I said, it was. Uh, what I think I read one of the first couple of executive orders. I need to get back to the to the, to how our wealth is being taken away, but um, I read one that said something like what I said. It's it's repair work. <laughs> yeah, I I don't know. It it I do know that it was it's not meant to be what how it's being used today. Mm-hmm. But well, I'd like to hear incremental about, creep allows those kinds of things to happen. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'd like to hear more about uh, you know what you prepared for us on the uh, the financial system. So uh, go right ahead. Um, okay. Um, wanted to talk about oh okay we were on mortgages and things like car loans, HELOCs, which are the home equity lines of credit, uh, credit cards and lines of credit. Uh, but especially car loans and the home equity loans, which are amortized. Especially if anything's amortized, then the bank makes the, a higher rate of profit because the interest is set up. The, the, the amount of the payment that is interest is high on the front end and low on the back end, so the banks get their, their profit first. Mm-hmm. And remember when I was talking about the velocity of money, I want to go into how the banks create, well, the Federal Reserve, by manipulating the money supply, the velocity of money, they actually create bubbles. I look at the housing bubble and the dot-com bubble and even something like the Great Depression. These things, to me, are not accidents. Because you can manipulate that velocity of money, take the housing bubble, for example, money was made readily uh, available for home loans. Mm -hmm. And the interest rate went down. And so the velocity went up. And people were able to get in the houses even even before the, the, the real bad stuff came out, like the liar loans and the, the low low information loans and stories about uh, mortgage lenders putting in uh, information on people's application that wasn't true so they could push it through. Mm-hmm. You probably heard about things like that. Yeah. But it created this big velocity of money which brought in the house flippers and the everybody was 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 riding high because the value of everything was going up. But you look mm-hmm. at this and you say, this is unsustainable. So when the velocity of money was slowed down by starting to raise the interest rates, tightening the credit reporting uh, on the applications, that slowed down the whole process, and then people couldn't turn over what they had. In the meanwhile, a lot of people used their 
home as an ATM on this perceived value and took out loans on that and bought cars, vacations, things like that, thinking that the house price would go up forever when I really believe it was all planned that at some point it was going to stop and come crashing back down. And then when it did, people couldn't, and that coupled with things like NAFTA and GATT, taking our jobs and offshoring them, and the general slowdown of the economy when the velocity of money slowed down, then people were losing their jobs, and they were losing their houses, and then corporations moved in and bought foreclosed houses and blocks to turn them into rentals. Now, if I want to do some research on this, it would be interesting to find out who owns these corporations that were buying up blocks of houses, and I would not be surprised, although I won't blame them, um, that it had something to do with the banks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've I've seen and and heard of some stuff like that. As far as uh, what was happening in uh, Las Vegas for a while, there was a uh, there was like you know I think it was like one in three houses in Las Vegas were were empty. Uh, so you know there was a big the, housing boom. What was that? Yeah, and it it's happening again. Oh yeah, which is which is unfortunate. About a year ago, after all this crash sort of settled out, I started hearing on the radio, the, flip, the house flippers are back. The, the people who have their radio shows on how to flip or, or I don't watch TV, and I heard some commercial about this guy who hadn't had a show in a few years. He's back, and he's going to show you how to make money. And I'm thinking, <laughs> this is happening all over again. Yeah. And that was a year ago, and then just a few weeks ago, I heard on the news that Las Vegas is starting to have the same problem that they did before. Mm -hmm. And they're, yeah. they're one of the, the bellwether cities for looking at the housing situation for the entire country. Yep. Yeah, it's, now, it's these cycles of, uh, of boom and bust that they just they, they keep artificially creating. And you know, people are thinking that, that – uh, we're doing okay, it, well, at least they were thinking that we were doing okay, we were getting better and the economy is getting stronger because they look at the stock market. But I'm sure you know about what they're doing with QE, the quantitative easing that they've been doing where they are literally digitizing millions and millions and millions of dollars and they're pumping it into the stock market to in artificially inflate this stuff. And I'm sure they, I'm sure you know about how they are devaluing the money every time. Every dollar that they digitize is making all the other dollars worth less. But they're continuing to do this, and it's not helping us. It's not it's not making us any money out of anything. In fact, it's it's hurting us because the money that we have in our bank account is if we had a hundred dollars and they printed off more and more money, you know, the value of each individual dollar lowers. So, I mean, it could be $75. Right. It could be $50. And so if they keep doing it, eventually the dollars will not stop. They'll stop being worth less and less, but they'll eventually become worthless, and they won't be worth the, pr the paper that they're printed on. And, and, they, and they try to tell us that, oh, the, it's supply and demand that makes prices go up, uh, maybe to a small extent. But when you double the money supply, even if it was backed with something, and you double the money supply, then each bill or note would be worth half. But now we have a money supply that's not backed with anything, except the military maybe. And mm -hmm. <laughs> what is it really worth? And you'll you'll hear you'll read all these reports about since the Federal Reserve came into being in 1913, our dollar today is worth depending on who you read, 2%, 3%, 5%. Wow. Wow, that's unbelievable. Yeah, I, I've, I've heard stories about how it's, you know, it's worth like 20-something cents compared to what it was before, even less like, and like I said, like you said, uh, uh, depending on the source, what you read, I, I've heard of that too. But, you know, honestly, I, I, don't, I don't even believe that those statistics are up to date anymore because we don't even understand, it, we can't even comprehend the amount of money that they're digitizing right now and pumping into the economy. And, and again, that's not helping me and you. You know, that's draining our bank accounts to a hidden tax where they're making our dollars worth less and less and less. It's also, 
devaluing the amount of money that we owe China. We still owe them a crap load of money, but the amount that that money buys now is not worth as much. So, you know, we can continue to print it and print it and print it and print it and pay our debts that way, I suppose. But that's not... Well, Go ahead. and there's another reason that, that for all this, all this printing, because they gave it to the banks. The banks were supposed to give it out to people to stimulate the economy, but they've been holding on to it and in, in a more secretive manner speculating. Mm-hmm. And like I said, I wouldn't be surprised that some of these companies that buy up housing and turn them into rentals would be somehow related to the bank. But that quantitative easing is not going to the banks and then turning back for us to start businesses and get jobs and things like that. It's more for speculation and buying mm-hmm. up smaller banks. Yeah, and it's making these uh, these multi-million dollar companies even more money because they're investing. That's what they're doing is they're investing in these companies to make the stock go up, to make the stock market boom. And this is unsustainable. It's a boom and bust cycle. Eventually it's going to bust and we're going to see the end of it. And, you know, the, the scary thing is is that when it busts, it no longer just takes away that market. You know, it's, it's not just going to drop the, the value of those uh, individual uh, companies, you know, it's going to it's gonna drop the value of the U.S. dollar. And right. it, the, the U.S. dollar will collapse at that point. And when that happens... And our, and our you know, general standing in the world, too. Yeah, absolutely. When that happens, uh, the, the rest of the world is going to realize, hey, we need to stop using the U.S. dollar. It's literally not worth the paper it's printed on now. And if they don't already realize that, I'm sure that we've heard over and over again well, China do. is in talks with – they're trying to get to another currency. Everybody is trying to get off the U.S. dollar right now, and it's because of the actions we're taking through quantitative ease. Right. The BRICS nation, uh, Brazil, Russia, India, Italy, China – have made an agreement uh, a few years ago that when they trade amongst themselves, they're not going to use the dollar. And mm-hmm. there ha- then there have been other agreements between other sets of countries about that, uh, doing similar things, and then Iran wants to um, use gold. <laughs> that would be great. Buy, you know, if you want to buy our oil, pay us in gold. But... Um, and then when um, uh, Muammar Gaddafi wanted to have a gold-backed African currency, then he was attacked by yeah. bankers. Yep. Yeah, you know, but, that's another thing. We're, we're really stuck on uh, having the U.S. dollar as the, the oil reserve currency, basically. And it, one of the most important things that these bankers and, you know, the, our government in general is to continue – uh, it, making it so that you have to buy your oil in U.S. dollars because first you got to buy U.S. dollars with whatever your currency is. you got to convert it, and then you got to use ours. So that makes us the world currency. And even if you look at, like, what would happen if the uh, the economy or the U.S. dollar collapsed uh, and, and, and the damage that it would do to, to us as a country uh, – it, just go ahead and forget that. For, forget what would happen if, if the dollar was worthless, okay? Think about I, I, because this is all it would take to really destroy us as a nation, uh, at least you know, really set us back really badly, is if every other country stopped taking our dollars. Even if our dollars were still there, if they just stopped taking our dollars for oil and we weren't the world standard anymore uh, for, for they, money. They would come flooding back. Exactly. The dollars and, would come and, flooding back as people exchange it for their own currency. Mm-hmm. And, and at that point, you know, I, our dollars would collapse at, at that point anyway. Everything that we would try to buy overseas through importing would skyrocket dramatically because we'd have to convert our stuff into their currency. Whatever the new world currency is, we'd be in the situation that they're in. Um, unless it's products that are made here, but fewer and fewer products are made here, so we have to go uh, out of the country to buy our stuff. That's a very good point. You know, at one point in the past, our our um, ancestors used to be in, independent. We used to have a lot of in, independency, and people looked at it like it was it was really important to be independent, to be self sufficient. You know, our our, our grandparents they uh, they grew uh, victory gardens after World War II. You know, it, this is something that if our president asked us to do that now, can you imagine what the reaction would be if if Obama got on the news and was like, hey, you know. We're really struggling as a, as, as a nation right now, and 
I need you guys to start growing your own gardens, and we're going to call them victory gardens, and it will ease the demand at the grocery store. Can you imagine if anybody would actually do that? Maybe a handful, but not very many people would listen to that well, nowadays. Most people don't have the space to do it, and, and I can't see that happening because agribusiness, <laughs> that would be competing with agribusiness, and they have their way with everything. Mm -hmm. So Yeah, absolutely. They, they got their hands in everything. And before we get off the subject of the um, quantitative easing, let me give you an example of, of how people profit off of, off of bubbles and mm -hmm. quantitative easing. The, okay. um, uh, John Paulson was the Secretary of Treasury, and he was doing shorting bets against the subprime mortgage bubble in 2007. And shorting means that you're, you're basically bet, basically he was betting against the housing industry. He was betting that the housing industry would fail and prices would go down. And this is a government worker mm -hmm. who should be helping us build things up. But he made off of these short, short bets $4 billion. He is now a billionaire betting against our country. Wow, that, I mean that's incredibly unpatriotic. Not to mention, uh, you know, I, w I would say that that's probably the equivalent of like insider trading when you you have the ability to affect the cha the value of your stock, you know, and you can you can you can bet against it if you want like that. Right, and if if you know that you're creating a you're part of the, the group that creates a bubble, hey, which is bad enough, why not profit off of it? Yeah, yeah, it's it's unbelievable. But you know what, uh, honestly. It's not. It shouldn't. It shouldn't be as, as unsurprising as it, as it is that people are doing that. You know, when people are put in these positions of power and they're they're not being controlled and regulated, and they just have free reign to do whatever they want. Obviously, corruption is going to go you know wild. So, yeah. Uh, another use for this quantitative easing is to manipulate the price of precious metals. Now. When sometimes if you follow precious metals, sometimes when the market opens at at nine o'clock, all of a sudden the the price of gold or silver just shoots down for a while. Mm -hmm. And what's happening is that there's a big sell-off, but there's got to be um, money involved for that sell-off. And there's the Gold Antitrust Action Committee, who has been GATA.org. I forgot to put that one down. Okay. GATA.org. Uh, they've been following these price manipulations, and one of the ways that the because if if you remember, silver was up at 50 bucks an mm -hmm. ounce at one time, and it just shot back down to about 20, and it's been just holding there. So there's a lot of short selling going on on silver. <clears throat> Now, there's physical silver and there's paper silver. And paper silver is just saying, I have this piece of paper in my hand that, is, that says that I bought an ounce of silver. But you don't really know with this piece of paper in your hand that you actually, there is actually an ounce of silver stored for you. It could be just like fractional banking, there's fractional silver, and there's only enough silver for the people that they expect that are going to want it back at any time. Yeah. So that's why a lot of people say if you're going to buy precious metals, get the physical stuff in your hand because you can't trust the paper. Now, yeah. if, if part of this money flooding in from quantitative easing and going to the banks is being used to just sell all this paper, with nothing backing it, and they're just printing a, a silver certificate printing press, like they're printing, like they're doing with the U.S. Uh, Federal Reserve note. Then these things are worthless, but they're on the market, and people think that they have a value. But it's actually driving down the price because they're selling off stuff that they don't have. And then there's naked short selling, which is when you don't even. You don't even have uh, the stuff in your hand. I, I, I haven't looked into that. We'll, we'll just go with short selling being depressing the price. 
And if the price goes down when you short sell, then you can repurchase it at the lower price and make a profit. So flood the market, bring down the price, repurchase. And that's <laughs> that, yeah, you know, and, and, and that's that's one thing that I find kind of hilarious is that you know we're told that we're crazy for wanting to buy something stable, something that has intrinsic value that's always been worth something, like gold and silver. Uh, but yet the federal government does this, and we see the um, the uh, like some other countries like China. China has decided that they're going to double and triple their uh, their gold reserves. So if it's okay for China to do that, why is why are we the crazy ones? Why are we the ones that that are trying to protect ourselves? But uh, you know we're crazy because we don't trust the value of the U.S. dollar. Obviously, other people out there organizations, uh, governments, they don't trust the value of the U.S. dollar and the stability of it, and they realize that it's reckless for them to put all their uh, all their reserves into that currency. So they're, they're looking for something, you know, to back uh, to back up their dollar, something stable, something that's not going to change. And, and one thing that you should keep in mind uh, is that if the U.S. dollar collapses uh, and it's worth nothing and everybody switches from the U.S. dollar to something else, the price of gold is going to skyrocket. And... The price of silver, which historically, before the U.S. dollar was, uh, when it was linked to the dollar, or when, it, when we were on a gold standard, when gold was valued per the amount of dollar that we had, basically, um, uh, silver used to be a percentage of what gold used to be. And right now, the percentage I doesn't think it match was up. A 19 to 1 ratio came, comes to mind. And exactly, right now the percentage does not match. So not only will the price of gold skyrocket, but the price of silver would ex go extremely through the roof compared to what it is right now. It would it would be insane because that, that ratio that it was historically been, it will match again. So whatever the new currency is, if it's backed through gold, uh, it, the price of gold will skyrocket and the price of silver will skyrocket even more in, in terms of the ratio. So, well, even before it crashes, if the short selling stops, then the price of gold will rise. I don't think it'll rise like a meteor or, or a rocket, but that's what's suppressing it, and, and the cover will be taken off, and it should go back up again. Mm -hmm. and, and that's why our, the gold went down. It used to be above $2,000 uh, for an ounce of gold. You know, I, I've had buddies that, that, that have been buying gold for a long time, and I was like, ah, you know, I'm not going to worry about it. When I started buying gold, it was, I think it was like close to, I want to say $1,000 for an ounce. And, and some of my friends, they, they got in when it was like 650 for an ounce. You know, it, it, Right now, the, the price of gold has dropped quite a lot compared to what it used to be. But, I mean, it, I was losing my mind when it was at $2,000 an ounce because I had already got in when it was like $1,000 an ounce. I was like, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm actually getting yeah. a quick investment on this. But I, I don't plan on selling my gold anytime soon. I mean, I, I hope to pass that down, hopefully. The, the thing about gold is that it will hold its value if the economy crashes. So it's not so much an investment as it is an alternate currency, if the dollar crashes, then the dollar goes down, and then you can convert your gold back to whatever new currency we're going to have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it, I mean, it's a, it's a hedge against inflation. It's a hedge against the uh, the economy, the the currency collapsing. It, it is a long term investment, though. I mean, if you it, don't obviously put all of your money into gold, that would be crazy if you just converted every single dollar you had into gold. Because then, you know, gold could could go just like any other stock. They could deflate it totally like, like they've been trying to do, and you lose out on all that money. But, you know, in the long run, I believe that gold will pay out, you know, and at some point, th this whole system that they have, this whole uh, basically um, inf inflation of, of the currency, the, the de devaluing of the gold and all this, it's all unsustainable, and it's going to pop. The bubble will burst. It's a, it's a cycle of booms and bursts. Or, and eventually, at some point, it's just not going to be able to sustain itself anymore, and it will all come crashing down. When it does, gold and silver are going to rise. Mark my words. You'll see that. And, it, you know, it, it'll happen. 
Exactly. So, so you know, and then you know, inflation happens anyway. So it, even if it doesn't happen, you know, historically speaking, the price has gone up. You know, and, and inflation makes it go up. And you know, we just so happen to be in a situation right now where our government is making things become more valuable through inflation, through quantitative easing. But hey, uh, at this point, Jim, uh, we're going to go ahead and take a quick uh, break. I'll be right back after about a minute thirty. Okay. Okay. All right. on the move help us make this podcast bigger and better you can do this by going to our store and purchasing one of our hundreds of products all designs are original and made for patriots like you just go to cafepress.com slash on the move show we appreciate your support need design services logo design for ninety dollars business cards brochures bumper stickers signs flyers promotional products such as mugs pins bags keychains, magnets, and so much more. Contact Latasha Worley for a quote on your next project at Tasha, T-O-S-H-A, at lworleyphotography.com today. Or visit me on the web at lworleyphotography.com. And on Facebook at facebook.com slash lworleyphotography. And on Twitter at twitter.com slash Tasha Worley. Show your support for a designer who believes in the Constitution and your rights. And we're back. When we last left, I had the voice of reason on the show, and we are talking about the financial system. Are you there, sir? I'm still here. All right. I want to give another reason uh, to um, to buy gold, and it's the fact that it seems well. I shouldn't say fact. It seems like banks are taking people's assets illegally and getting away with it. And it's another reason to have something on your person or in your possession. Now, the first time I heard about this was I was listening to the Alex Jones show, and Gerald Flynn, who used to be a regular guest, was talking about how he lost uh, about $100,000 in a company called MS Global. And this went into the... I believe, a congressional hear, uh, hearing where John Corzine, who was an executive at MF Global at the time, was, was saying that I don't know nothing about anything. And there was some memo saying that MF Global was called to pay a uh, debt to a foreign bank, and MF Global didn't have it. So somebody suggested take it out of somebody's accounts. And so a number of accounts were robbed. And when Gerald Salente called, because he said that his, okay, he had $100,000 in there, and he said, when I, when I get to a certain dollar amount or when gold gets down to a certain amount, buy gold with it. And so that point, trigger point happened. He thought that the transaction was made when he looked at his statement the next time. It was zero. And he had the call to find out, where's my gold? And he said, well, if you want your gold, you're going to have to pay $100,000. Oh, wow. Said, well, I have $100,000 in here. So basically his money disappeared. <laughs> and for a year after I was following that story, this was about three years ago now, following the story, and he still hadn't gotten his, his money back, and it turns out there was a lot of other customers who were robbed too, but him being a guest on the Alex Jones show, I got to listen to him and follow follow through what he was doing. And so I'm going to read something here. So that's, okay. that's one example. And this came from an article from Occupy Corporatism and also repeated in other sources. In June of 2012, Eric Bloom, former chief executive, and Charles Mosley, head trader of Sentinel Management Group, were indicted for stealing $500 million in customer-secured funds. Now, uh, remember, uh, these are segregated funds. They're not pooled, and they basically belong to each investor. 
And this was, this was the way Gerald's Lundy's money was. To continue with this, both Mosley and Bloom were accused of exposing customer segregated funds to a portfolio of highly risky derivatives. These customer funds were used to back up personal investments, which were part of collateral for a loan from the Bank of New York Mellon. This loan derived from stolen customer money was used to purchase millions of dollars of high-risk, illiquid securities, including collateralized debt obligations or CDOs, or a trading portfolio that benefited Sentinel's officers, including Mosley, Bloom, and certain Bloom member family members. Fast forward to August 9th of 2012, the Seventh Circuit of Court of Appeals ruled that Bank of New York Mellon could be moved to the first of the line of creditors over the customers that had their funds stolen by SMG. When the banking customer deposits their money into a bank account, the FDIC and the Securities Investment Protection Corporation, SPIC, are in place to protect the customer from fraud or theft. Ruling from the circuit court means that these regulatory systems will not ensure next page <laughs> not ensure customer funds, investments, depositors, or retirees who hold accounts in banks. In fact, the banking institution is now legally allowed to use these customer funds deposited as collateral payments on debts for loans or free use on the stock market to purchase investment as the bank sees fit. So we're saying that the bank, you have segregated funds in an, in an account, you think that this is your retirement, the bank can use it and to enrich the bank or particular bank members, and then if any other financial institution is harmed, they move for, to first in line to be made whole. And the original depositor is at the back of the bus. This is crazy. And so, that, so this is a situation where we have the, the, the courts basically uh, deciding and backing the banks over the people. Right. And just like uh, when I was on the show last time about this one court case where a guy proved that the 16th Amendment was not ratified and the judge dismissed the case instead of ruling on it, saying that I don't want to be the first person in my court to admit that the 16th Amendment was not ratified. It's unbelievable. That's, it's, it's really unbelievable that we have such cowardly people in the judiciary branch. You know, th these judges refuse to stand up and, and actually stand for the people um, and, and for the republic. You know, th this all comes back to... You know, the, the way that we've, uh, we've established the republic to begin with, there was no way that our founders would have been able to know that, that what has happened would have affect, affected the checks and balances that we were supposed to have. You know, the, the, and just to give you an example here, uh, you know, about how the checks and, uh, checks and balances were supposed to work, and, and obviously this is for my audience as, as well, uh, the, the people were supposed to vote in the House of Representatives. And... Uh, you know, the, the Senate was supposed to be comprised of people that were picked from the, the actual states. Uh, because of this, that the House representative votes the way the people want them to vote, or they're voted out of office if they ignore the will of the people. So let's say, for example, the House didn't listen to the people, and they decided to pass a law that went against the will of the people in the first place. You know, the, the law would then have to go through the Senate, which it would vote based on the best interest of the states, Okay, so, so right there is another, another check and balance. Then it would go to the president, who would have an opportunity to veto it if he felt it was unconstitutional. And all these checks, every way down, they're supposed to be like basically finding out if it's constitutional or not. Uh, then it would go uh, through the courts, and its constitutionality would then again uh, be challenged if, you know, if and when somebody uh, broke that law. And if the judges refused to call law unconstitutional, uh, the, the people... Uh, would be the ones who would decide because you're judged by a jury of your peers. And this leads me to my next conversation, uh, jury nullification. Jury nullification is, is the act of people seeing the, the letter of the law, seeing what the law says, but deciding that a law is unjust or unconstitutional. And you as a juror are not obligated 
to, to uh, say innocent or guilty based on what the law says. You have the ability to decide whether or not the law has merit in the first place, if the law is unconstitutional, and it comes back to you. So if your representatives decide to enact a law and not listen to you in the first place, not only can you vote them out come next election, you can go through impeachment processes to get them out. However, you can also, through jury nullification, decide that a law is unjust and decide not to uh, prosecute or have that person go to jail. So we've seen this in uh, in marijuana prosecution cases throughout the country in recent history. And you know, right now we have uh, we have this. We're supposed to have this huge circle of checks and balances. And uh, do you see how that's changed? I mean, obviously it's it's been drastically altered. And, and another thing is the way judges run their their courts by saying, "I will tell you what the law is." Well, the original intent on, for a jury was to judge the guilt and, as well as judge the law. Absolutely. So now and, we have and now, judges saying that, I'll, I'll tell you what it is. Exactly. We have judges that will also refuse to allow the, the, the defense to even explain the process of jury nullification. They, they've basically banned the explanation from their courts. You can't even talk about it now without being held in contempt and that information being striked from the ju jury's uh, you know, uh, ability to, to use, basically. Well, I, I joke about this, but this is true. If you're called for jury duty and you don't want to go, take out a copy of the juror's handbook and read it while you're waiting, and you will not be called. <laughs> That's that's actually pretty funny. You know, honestly, I look at I, I have never served on jury duty, but I am dying to serve on jury duty because I, that's all I'm going to be doing is looking at the letter of the law, and if I decide that the law is unconstitutional, you know, whether or not what it is, I, I hope I get some kind of traffic situation. That'd be amazing because I don't I don't believe that most of the traffic laws that we have are indeed constitutional. So, you know, I'm gonna take one look at the guy and know he's innocent. You know what I mean? Like, but. But, I, you know, I think it's my, my obligation, my, my duty as a citizen to go through and, and do this. And, I, you know, I'll, I'll make a hung jury. i got nothing but time as far as I'm concerned. I'll stay in that courtroom all day. You know, I, I'll drag this out as long as possible, but I'm not changing my mind. I, I would, you know, if, if I thought that the law was unconstitutional, I would absolutely say he's innocent. You know, but obviously that's, that's up to the jurors to, to decide. And, uh, you know, there is, you cannot get in trouble for, for saying innocent when you find that the law is unjust. So keep that in mind, everybody. Jury nullification is real. Do your own research. Don't take my word for it. Uh, and, you know, find it yourself. But, you know, the 17th Amendment has changed everything about the way our republic uh, it operates. And, it, you know, it's basically created an opportunity for disaster. And no one's looking out for the states. They have no voice because of this. And we're all at risk because of that. Yeah, oh, so how much time? Oh, do we so, have? Yeah, yeah, I mean, as far as uh, as far as that, what what are your thoughts on uh, on the Seventeenth Amendment and, and the way that they they basically impose that? Oh, uh, actually, I need to go back and read the Seventeenth Amendment. That's why I'm going oh. to that Constitution class that's happening. Oh yeah. Hey, well, yeah, and, you, and again, have you mentioned oh, that ahead. Constitution class? Uh, not today. I'll talk about it here. Uh, Facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash constitutional study group. Uh, or you can go to my YouTube channel, YouTube.com forward slash on the move show. And I have videos of our study sessions that we, ha we hold here uh, one Sunday a month at 1 p.m. on uh, at Coffee Villa. And I basically, I, I, it's raw footage of, of our uh, meeting at the constitutional study group. We had one last week. Uh, I've been working on it and I haven't had an opportunity to post it yet, but once I finish up, uh, we'll have the third study session on there, and you guys can uh, check it out if you want. Uh, Jim, we got a few more minutes here before I'm going to start wrapping up the show. Uh, is there anything that you wanted to uh, to talk about in the last few minutes here? Well, uh, a couple of things. While I was on the subject of banks stealing your stuff, so I just talked about how banks steal your account. There's also plenty of evidence that, that contents of safety deposit boxes have been stolen by Bank of America and other financial institutions, and a little excerpt from Ludwig von Mises Institute, a San Francisco's woman's jewelry appraised at $80,000 was sold even though she lived a few blocks from the bank, had not moved, and was current on all her box rental fees. In another case, a man's retirement savings of $4 million 
of stock certificates were sold, and also a Sacramento family lost out on railroad land rights that their ancestors owned for generations. Uh, I'm assuming that there was some paperwork that was, was taken. What started is that, out... Is, is that eminent asset, domain? Not eminent domain. What, it started off as civil asset for, forfeiture program saying that, um, well, if, if we think that somebody is a criminal, we should have access to their safety deposit box. And, th and this was for certain crimes. But then after time, this list of crimes is relaxed to the point where anything can be a crime, and that's an excuse to go to the box. The other thing is that if your safety deposit box is unclaimed for five years, and it should be for five years, and the the bank, the institution should be taking all efforts to locate the owner of the box. Well, that program has become lax in the efforts to locate the property owners, also lowering the five, shortening the five-year hold period so they can get to the content sooner. Oh, wow. So whether you have an account or whether you have stuff in a bank, and, and this has been going on in England also, so there's a danger there. And then one last thing I want to want everybody to know, because this is Super Bowl Sunday, and I don't even know who won. I think the game is over right now. <laughs> yeah, I have no idea. Yeah, I want to know why is the National Football League a nonprofit charitable organization? It's listed as a trade union. Why is the average NFL stadium mostly to totally funded by the public? Many of the employees of this tax exempt charity make over $25 million a year. Uh, I just heard that Drew Brees is the highest mm -hmm. paid person at $51 million a year from a nonprofit charitable organization. So finally, a couple of people with some sense, Senator Angus King from Maine and Tom Coburn from Oklahoma are now writing a bill to end the NFL's tax exempt status, which is estimated to be worth about $9 billion per year. That is NFL awesome. Is that, is that $9 billion, of, of, is that nine billion uh, grow, that they gross, or is that $9 billion taxable? That, that's uh, the projected uh, savings on their tax exempt status versus if they were a regular corporation. Holy cow. So, so the government would have $9 billion more dollars in tax money? Per year. Wow, that is unbelievable. You know, you know I didn't know that they, they were actually a tax-exempt status, but I, I did know that, that you know a lot of our stadiums are, are built with taxpayer dollars, and they say that, well, hey, it's going to bring jobs to, to the, the area, and people are going to come to the city. It's going to bring prestige to us, and people are going to know about us, and they're going to want to visit us and come see the games and stuff like that. And, and that's their, their claim as to why we should pay all this taxpayer money to build stadiums uh, for a multi-million dollar organization. It, it, it comes down to um, taking as much profit as you can and spreading out the liability as much as you can. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Which includes costs. Mm -hmm. Well, hey, I, I really do appreciate you coming on. And uh, at this point, I'm going to uh, cut to a commercial break, and then I'm going to take the last five minutes or so to wrap up the show. Again, everybody, that is uh, the voice of reason, and I really do appreciate you coming on the show. And, uh, you know, we'll work out whenever the next time you can do this. I, I had a really good time having you on. Thank you so much. Same here, Mac. All righty. You have a good one. All right, so at this point, we're going to go ahead and take a quick commercial break. I'll be back, and we're going to wrap everything up. Thanks for sticking with us. on the move help us make this podcast bigger and better you can do this by going to our store and purchasing one of our hundreds of products all designs are original and made for patriots like you just go to cafepress.com slash on the move show we appreciate your support need design services logo design for $90 business cards brochures bumper stickers signs flyers promotional products such as mugs pins bags keychains, magnets, and so much more. 
contact Latasha Worley for a quote on your next project at Tasha, T-O-S-H-A, at lworleyphotography.com today. Or visit me on the web at lworleyphotography.com. And on Facebook at facebook.com slash lworleyphotography. And on Twitter at twitter.com slash Tasha Worley. Show your support for a designer who believes in the Constitution and your rights. All right, we're back. All right, so I want to quickly get to the next segment of the show. It's the Listener Challenge. I challenge you to a duel. Did you hear that? Sounds like it's time for a challenge. Listener Challenge. Listener Challenge. Listener Challenge. All right, this is the segment of the show where I challenge you to get out there, get on the move, get active. So your mission, if you choose to accept it, is to write your Congress men and women and let them know that you expect them to op- oppose Obama's unconstitutional power grab. Demand that they oppose the use of executive orders to create law. Let them know that you're watching them and how they react will drastically affect the way that you vote in the next election. I know it's easy to get burnt out. Believe me, I know. But we have to keep pressure on these people. If we don't stay on them and keep telling them what we expect, they will do whatever it is that they want and think no one's paying attention. It will allow the, the cronyism, the, the crony capitalism that we've seen over and over and over again to continue. It's just going to perpetuate the same problem. This is a very simple and an easy way to hold these people accountable. There's no excuse for not doing this. If, if every single one of us wrote our representatives once a week, they would take notice. Believe me when I tell you, they get these letters and phone calls. It's critical that we keep the pressure on. I know it's hard to stay motivated, but it's like that by design. They want you to get discouraged. They want you to give up. Don't let them have the satisfaction. If they can chip away at our rights little by little, then we can get them back the same way. Keep it up. Your country is counting on you. I would also like it if you would please do us all a favor. And when you write your representatives, please post your letter and any responses that you get at facebook.com forward slash on the move show. I want to see what you're saying to them, and I want everyone else to be able to as well. This will allow the, the other people who are checking the site to, to use your letters themselves if they don't know what to say or they don't have time to write. And it also allows us all to see, the, see what you're saying and see the responses that you're getting from our elected representatives. This is a great way to hold them all accountable. We can use this to find out who needs to go and who is really looking out for our best interest. So... With that in mind, I want to take the last few uh, minutes of the show here to talk about the the money that we were talking about. We talked about all the problems and why our money is being deflated and and what we should do and, 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 you know, basically uh, what's going on. So, you know, what should we invest in? What's safe? Is it gold? Is it silver? Well, you know, I'm not I'm not an economist. I don't I don't know what's going to happen, but I think gold and silver will be really important to stay stay invested in. You know, not all of your money, but some of it. It's going to be a good hedge against inflation and a really great protection in case the currency does devalue and collapse. So, what else can we invest in? Well, if if you ask me, I think that you should invest in food. And the reason why I say that is because food has historically always been worth something. Always. And no matter the situation, food, especially in times of emergency, will always increase in price. So if, if you would take my opinion, uh, feel free to go to, uh, to onthemoveshow.com. Check out our shop. I have on there an affiliate store through the freeze-dry guy. And they have really affordable freeze-dried food. Freeze-dried food lasts for 25 years. So this is an investment just like gold is. Uh, you know, and honestly... What, what better way to protect yourself than to, to buy food? You will always eat food. At, if you spent $1,000 right now on this food, it's going to be cheaper to, to get a year's supply of food uh, this way than to buy it, you know, going to fast food places and buying it at the grocery store. You're going to spend far more money per year on your food bill than if you buy it freeze-dried and eat it then and there or eat it as you need it at that point. It lasts for 25 years. It's not going to go bad. And this food is delicious, by the way. Mountain House food, I don't know if you've ever had it, but it is amazing. Again, that's at onthemoveshow.com, and just click on the shop link, and it's the Free Drag Guy affiliate store that I have right there. Uh, I really appreciate everybody tuning in today. 
And, you know, I want to hear what you guys have to say on the next next show. So uh, give us a call at 619-924-0986, or you can email me at talk at on the move show and let me know what you have to say. If you have a topic you'd like me to cover, send me a message, and I will, uh, I will cover it on the next show. Uh, all right, so don't forget to check us out at onthemoveshow.com, here at blogtalkradio.com forward slash onthemoveshow, facebook.com forward slash onthemoveshow, twitter.com forward slash onthemoveshow, and youtube.com forward slash onthemoveshow. And as always, know your rights, assert your rights, and get on the move.